Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's greatest comedians. And we've got one for you today. Stuart France is a man who's been making me laugh for many, many years and he's back on tour across the UK doing the business and also appearing uh, on Stand Up on Everest. We'll talk about that later. Stuart Francis, how are you? Hello, Alex. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm delicious for my age. And what's great about you is you're still as funny as you ever were, and I love it. You do gags, and I've told you this before. We need more gags and jokes. They don't seem to do them anymore. I got a whole tour of them. Come see me. (laughs) You make life hard work for yourself, though, don't you? Because your show probably has 10,000 gags in it. (laughs) Oh, jeez. There are a lot of gags. Don't know if it's quite that many, but it's, it's the best style of comedy for my for my money it's, it's more bang for your buck how do you think of them i know it's a question i've asked before but there are so many of them they're scattergun they keep coming and coming and coming are you sat there with a pen and a piece of paper and writing them down no that would make me a very sad individual i just <laughs> i, I kind of i live my life and uh, the jokes come i'll hear a turn of phrase and oh well that's interesting so just I kind of get on with things, and uh, I've got—I write them down. I'm a—I'm a scribbler, so I, I will write things down. But no, I—I've only consciously sat down and written two jokes, which are two of my best jokes. With that's Tommy something right there. May I ask for one of them? Uh, I was waiting for my my buddy. He was a therapist. This isn't a joke. So I, he was late, and I was getting upset. Um, I forget how the joke goes. <laughs> I thought it was your best one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've something about my therapist, but yeah, it was hilarious. Have you ever had therapy? I mean, having seen your show, I mean, I'm not saying that you need it, but it could help. No. Thank you for that. Uh, no, I, I, I have a therapist. It, it's a running kind of theme in all my shows where I, I talk about my therapist says I'm, you know, and then so it's just set up in a punch. But no, uh, so far, so good, Alex. Take me back to the beginning and how you got into this, because you've worked with some of the biggest and the best. I mean, in America, you work with Jay Leno and people like that. Um, How did you come to the point today where you can sell out your own tour? Because that's the dream for any comedian. Of course it is. And it's a dream I I didn't think I'd realize, quite honestly. But uh, Plan A, I'm Canadian, so that's Plan A-E-H, started (laughs) me wanting to be a, uh, a cartoonist. That was back in the 80s, and I sent out my cartoons to six American syndicates with the dream of becoming a daily syndicated cartoonist. Got six rejection letters, so I was too thin-skinned for that. So plan B was to go on stage as a comedian, so what can go wrong there? Well, exactly. I mean, if you can't do anything else in life, be a comedian. That's what I said. Exactly. Uh, but I always I knew I had the, uh, the funny gene in me. It's my British kind of parents uh, have instilled humor in me, and um, I knew I, I, I was kind of a funny chap, um, and I didn't want to work. Uh, the com- combination of those two things uh, made, me, uh, made me want to do uh, comedy. Do you ever worry that you're going to open your mouth and nothing will come out? That would be my fear with your act, because it is so gag-intensive, and it's so brilliantly written. You can't just pad and fill and hope they won't notice. Well, that's the thing. Uh, you, you just uh, you just go on and on stage and just do the best you can and, and hope for the best. And so then you find yourself doing it for a living. Of course, Canada is a mecca for comedy. I went to the Montreal Comedy Festival. Do you enjoy those sort of venues when you're surrounded by other comics, or do you enjoy wo- working by yourself? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, I l- love to see people. Like at a festival, you'll see uh, acts from different parts of the world that you will have never seen before live may have heard of their reputation and so it's, it's great in that sense it, it's funny you should mention montreal it's probably the best comedy festival in the world but it is probably the worst comedy city in the world which is a really bad combination they're they're um i don't know what it is about the um the people in montreal that go to the festival it's it's uh it's kind of it has a reputation amongst the comedians as really being a tough a tough gig but mm-hmm. it's unfortunate because it's such a colossal festival uh, it'd just be great if we had a better audience. So what is that then? Is it because you're setting yourself up as the best, they want to be impressed more, or they no, just don't I, like comedy? I, I, I don't know if they don't... Uh, they don't like my style of comedy. And I've, I've, that was part of the uh, the circuit. I used to go to Montreal, and I'd have some dire uh, nights there. Just um, lovely people, uh, but not, you know, it's just they're just um, not into it. And um, uh, it's, it's funny that, it, that that's... You know where the the, the the kind of the number one festival is. Yeah, I've never been to Melbourne, but I hear, I hear that's great, and the audiences down there are, are, are just awesome. That's interesting. And then, of course, you find yourself in America and writing for other people. I was in Canada.
Canada, Alex, doing that. Uh, you could have done it. Um, and what, what I did, it was uh, you, you fax. You signed, trying to release the new fax jokes to the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Wow. And uh, the eighth joke I faxed him was used, uh, which is incredible because I heard afterwards that comedians of a, a higher uh, profile than me had been sending hundreds of jokes to him, never getting one used. So my eighth one was used, and I sent another eight. None of them were used, and I lost interest. But uh, I was very pleased with myself. That's one of the highlights of my career was him using one of my jokes to close a monologue on a Monday night after a week off. So his mm-hmm. writers had a week to come up with great gags. So it was a very, uh, I, I watched it. I was watching it that night, and I was very jubilant after that. I guess those late shows are the last bastions of topical humour, aren't they? They're the only ones really doing daily gags about daily stuff. Um for you at this point, is that something you'd consider doing again, or do you just write for yourself now? Just write for myself. Uh, I've only, I've never used anybody else's material. I just write for myself, and I, I've actually written a sitcom that um, uh, is currently being uh, shopped around by uh, NBC uh, Universal. Um, so here's hope, and that gets you know at, at least a uh, you know a green light for a uh, pilot. Fantastic. What's it about? Can you give us any clues? It, it, yeah, it's a, kind of like a, I love Family Guy. I love those setup and quick cutaways and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of like a, a live version of that. And it's about me living here in the UK. Um, things have kind of gone pear-shaped for me in Canada. And I heard that I had, had extended family over here. Lo and behold, my entire family are over here. I've got uh, upwards of six, seven, eight brothers, sisters. My mother and father who put me up for adoption when I was 13, which seems harsh because that's an old age to put a kid up for adoption they went on to have three or four kids after that so <laughs> my entire family are over here so it's a fish out of water and it's me tracing tracing my family um much like um you know a long lost families um, but uh, it's it's the it's lost long family because i find out that my family's name is uh surname is long so wow. it's just me going over over around the uk and running into some very eccentric uh characters that are my uh, my relatives and i've got a sidekick a british sidekick and uh, uh, someone who's uh, agreed to do that is a, of a very high profile. So it's just waiting for the green light. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that. Give us an insight as an outsider as how difficult it is, even with your fame and success, to get something on the air. It's not easy, is it? Not at all. I, I thought, you know, not not speaking of, with, with bravado that uh, it should be, a, you know, I've got fans that are reading these scripts in, in the form of TV executives that can make it happen but it's just so tediously slow. You know, you submit the script and you expect to get a call, you know, later that day, but it doesn't work out that way. And wonderful shows like uh, um, Catastrophe, uh, my understanding is that took three or four years to finally kind of make it to uh, uh, to, to the screens. Uh, so it's it's tediously slow. It's like a hurry up and wait kind of mentality. But uh, yeah, and I know other people with uh, even higher profiles than me that are, are trying to get things made and it just, it beggars belief, but it, it's it's the nature of the beast. So you just uh, you just hope, and it's it's a good uh, it's a good sitcom, probably the best thing I've ever done. So it, it would be a shame if it didn't um, at least have a pilot. Is one of the core skills of a comedian your resilience and your ability to keep fighting and moving forward? Because I was talking to a comedian earlier who was telling me about in the beginning they lost their car, they couldn't afford the payment because in the beginning you don't get paid to do comedy, you do it for free, then you get £10, then £20, £25, £30, etc. Um, is that something you have to have built within you, that you've got to be prepared to work, you've got to have a work ethic and keep going, be tenacious? Absolutely. Uh, it's a very much right place, right time. So just kind of get yourself out there, but also be uh, honest with yourself. Uh, are, are you good? Like, there, I think there's a lot of people that are uh, misguided and deluded, not just in comedy, and, and they're pursuing something they probably shouldn't be pursuing because they just might not, you know, it might not be working or might not work out for them. But be honest with yourself. And I, I knew that I had something, I was on to something, and I would see it through to the bitter end. And, and it doesn't look like there's going to be a bitter end. It's just it's just getting sweeter and sweeter. I love it when you appear on the uh, chat shows, 8 out of 10 caps or any of those sort of things. You always fit in, and it is like a jigsaw puzzle. A lot of people fail at those miserably. Is there a recipe to that, or is it just that your face fits and your comedy works and you don't get in the way of the others? Well, all those things, yeah. Uh, it just, and listening, um, you you got to be in the moment because uh, that's when some of my... Uh, one of the, you know some of my better gags would come out of out of the blue uh, on Mock the Week or, or the like. Uh, they they like me for my my stand up the, the, the stand up round, so they appreciate that. But yeah, uh, it, it's very challenging though to because uh, those are essentially two and a half hour uh, tapes. 
yeah. uh, which is edited down to a half hour for your uh, your viewing pleasure. Uh, so it's 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 pretty intense that you're sitting there, like being in a pretty an intense conversation for two and a half hours, right. and just wait to uh, to chime in. And it's I, I'd be watching too after not knowing how the edit would work would work out. And I wouldn't be saying anything. I'd be, come on, Francis, say something for goodness sake. Yeah. Knowing full well I did say something, it just didn't make it to edit. I remember talking to Dara O'Brien once, and he was saying that on some shows for Mock the Week, it can end up sort of like a battle and a joust. That doesn't really work, does it? Because you've got to all be on the same page laughing at each other. If you're competing, it sort of becomes uncomfortable. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it's just like uh, just like now, if someone's speaking over someone, it, it no one's going to make anything out of that. And that's yeah, seven seven individuals sharing one microphone so yeah uh, some can be a little more selfish and, and less uh, you know less willing to play with the others um, um, but but it's 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 just we live in a polite society so you let someone else say something and then with the confidence that you'll come in with something on top of that um, you know but uh, yeah you let someone else have their say because you, you, it's for the greater good you know it's a television show that we're all going to benefit from so just will bide your time and, and, and when you do have something to say, say make sure it's hilarious. And thankfully, due to my amazing editing skills, there won't be any talking over in this interview. It'll be flowing beautifully. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> I hope you take this as a compliment. And you know I'm a big fan of yours, so I'm being a little bit oh, sick of fancy. I don't like the way this is shaping up. Well, I think you're probably up there with Ken Dodd in terms of your mind in comedy. I've never known anybody else other than you and him who can store so much and pull it out of the bag at a whim. Have you worked out how your brain works differently to everyone else's? Because I couldn't remember the number of gags you do. Is it a special skill? Oh, I thank you for that. First of all, it's, uh, that's high praise indeed, because he's, he's, a, he's a legend. He's been doing it forever. Um, it, it, there must be a, 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 an aspect of my brain that just kind of allows me to do that. I, have, I do have a good memory. Couldn't remember the great joke that I wrote about my therapist, and I apologize about that. But that's that's how my brain needs to work. Yeah. The two previous tours, those jokes, they're gone. I, I because I can't have them in my brain. I need only the new jokes to be in my brain. So it'd be a struggle to come up with that. And people will quote jokes from previous tours, and I'm like, wow, what a great joke forgot it completely it's like it's like almost like the first time i'm hearing that joke because my brain needs to kind of shut that 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 down and kind of keep all the the new stuff fresh so it's 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 just the way it, i'm grateful that i found something that i'm good at that is you know how i make my living so it worked out pretty nicely for me it must be a bit depressing in a way to throw away an entire show it's a bit like getting rid of an ugly baby and getting a new one that's more attractive i mean it's a bit sad isn't it that you've worked so hard on this thing and then after a year you have to start it again oh. I appreciate what you're saying, but but no, it's it's uh, upward and onward. It's um, you know, be motivated by that. If, if you know, my two previous tours, I'm very proud of them. That was then, and and that that kind of gives me the impetus to kind of just do an even better show. And I, I'm I'm going into this tour more confident and and more excited about this tour than both those tours combined. Which mm. uh, if you've seen them, you, uh, you know, I'm probably over overselling this one, but. I'm genuinely quite excited about this one, and there's an added aspect to this tour that wasn't on the two previous tours, a technical kind of thing, which I think uh, the people will really appreciate. Well, I love seeing you live. I've seen you live several times over the years, and you are truly impressive. And as a man who can stand on a stage and deliver such brilliance consistently, I think can only be admired, so I congratulate you on that. And uh, if people want to find out more, what's your website to get tour tickets? Yeah, it's... uh LiveNation.co.uk or my, my website, StuartFrancis.com. Brilliant. And then later in the year, uh, in 172 days' time, you're doing Stand Up on Everest. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great cause. It's for Save the Children. It's We're doing, uh, me and five other great uh, comedians are going to be doing a stand-up show at Base Camp of Mount Everest, uh, which I believe will be the world record for the highest uh, stand-up show ever. There's 50 people that will be coming. Uh, any any of your listeners can come. Uh, there's tickets still available, I understand. And it's just, uh, it's going to be documented, I think, on ITV. There's a, a talk of that. So it's just going to be a phenomenal experience. And uh, and we're going to do a show when we uh, at the end of it. I'd like to come, but could you relocate to somewhere a little warmer? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's going it's it's to be challenging. Uh, I, I've done the <laughs> Andes, uh, and that's the most physically demanding thing I've ever experienced. And I've watched, uh, I've watched The Hangover too. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be a tricky one in that sense. But um, it's all for a good cause, and uh, here's hoping we all come back five, you know, six up, uh, you know, four or five back. 
standuponeverest.co.uk is the website for that and you can Google Stuart Francis to get all of the ticket information for the 2015 tour. You're a real pro. It's always lovely talking to you and good luck with the rest of the year. Thanks for talking to me, Stuart. You're a gentleman.